Hi, my name is Paul Langua. I play with the Tragically Hip and with the Paul Langua band. Let's rock. Hey, Ken. Hey, Paul, how you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Welcome to Let's Rock. Uh, Thank you. Great to have you here. Uh, congratulations, by the way, on the new album. I love it. I think it's great. It's called Guess What? Uh, oh, thanks. I guess it came out about what, three weeks ago? Yeah, give or take, about that. Yeah, um, so we might as well just get into the nitty-gritty of it. Uh, I want to know everything about it, the who's and the what's and the where's and the why's. Well, the who's are, um, you know, I'm playing guitar and singing. It's actually, some people have kind of mistakenly thought that I'm not singing, like that it's Paul Langwell band and I'm playing guitar, which is, sort of more what I'm known for but no I'm a singer and uh, I wrote the songs and I put a band together all of uh, case and buddies you know that um, mostly work uh, full-time other jobs but um, are great musicians and uh, play gigs when they can so uh, the four guys I asked they all said yes so there's Greg Ball who's a singer songwriter in his own right I've produced three of his records over the years um, and he does great backups, too. Uh, there's Joe Carascallon playing kind of lead guitar, rhythm and lead. Um, and he's a great guy. And Joe and Greg and I are in another outfit called Campfire Lars Club with Jim Tidman. And um, on bass is Matt Mulvihill, and um, he's from Brockville. And he used to be in a band called Zipper Belly, which uh, actually did pretty well in and around Brockville uh, years ago, like in his 20s. And... Um, Drummer is Bill Anglin, and um, he was a kid that we knew about that Johnny Faye uh, had the same drum teacher, were a few a few years older than Bill, and Johnny always said, yeah, that Billy Anglin, he's he's really good. So anyway, he's he's uh, a big key to the, the sound of this record and the sound of uh, when we play live, and uh, yeah, anyway, so just ended up having a lot of fun with them, you know, rehearsing for this one gig I was offered. And um, then after that, I was like, well, I could, maybe I could try writing some songs and maybe we can record. So um, the gig was at the end of August in Niagara Falls last year. And I set a deadline by booking the hip studio uh, for November 7th for a week. And so I had to get all the songs written. I just had no choice. Deadlines really work well for me as my tendency is to not write songs <laughs> really well i mean i don't know i don't really sit around writing i might record a guitar riff or something but i need to have like a goal like and once i started playing with these guys right you know rehearsing and that kind of thing it was like wow they're these guys are just my kind of band i'm really liking it and so i just uh then i put my head down and and really tried to write 10 songs that I believed in and and um, that I could uh, be proud of. And uh, that's what happened. Pardon me for this, but I don't read any other interviews or anything about the album before I do an interview with somebody because I don't want to, you know, get all the answers and then have nothing to ask. So if I've, if you've answered this a million times, I apologize. Oh, no uh, problem. Makes sense. I would do the same thing. Yeah, it's like when you write music, right? You don't want to listen to other bands. Cause no, it'll... I yeah, I listen to nothing when uh, writing and recording. Oh, nice. Um, it sounds really live. Like, it sounds like it's just raw and everyone was together. No overdubbing, nothing like that. It just sounds like a real live four guys in a studio jamming. Well, I'm, I would say thanks, and I'm glad you noticed. Um because that's exactly what happened. Matter of fact, I've never done this before, but I, I played guitar and sang at the same time. I had to re-sing one because uh, my voice was scratchy. It was uh, the middle of the night, and the next day it was kind of like, oh, that's just a bit too scratchy. And um, and I think Joe Carscallon overdubbed at least one solo, maybe another one like it, it kind of in the outro of uh i think two songs and then otherwise you know we couldn't record the backups at the same time though though those guys were singing um so very very live like uh, 
you know, there's some songs where I don't come into the chorus, but you can hear the guitar come in. And uh, yeah, we could all see each other well and just play together. You know, it, we were re well rehearsed for probably seven or eight of them. And then there was a couple there that we just kind of did on the fly and kept a, a take that was maybe uh, less rehearsed, but it was very much live the whole way. That's awesome. And I, I'm guessing that's very different from what you did in the past with the hip. Yeah, well, we, we always recorded live. Not always, but, um, you know, there were certain producers and records and or songs that was more of a build up kind of thing, like fully, completely. Yeah, we were there six weeks and by five weeks we hadn't done a thing and we just rehearsed. And and then sure enough, Johnny did the drums, Gord did the bass. I did my guitar. Robbie did his guitar. Gord sang. And then we did the backups all in the last week. And it built it. it that's just how Chris Tangaritas um, wanted to do it. And he was a producer. But for the most part, we played live. And um, it was just always tricky to get the vocal um, at the same time. It kind of depends on the studio. We, we're able to do it at our studio, the hip studio, bathhouse. Um, you know, you're in a separate room and all the, the, the doors... Uh, our glass doors so you can see but you really need to kind of do as much as you can to isolate the vocal right. I mean no one ever worried too much in the hip about bleed and I certainly didn't about other sounds bleeding into the uh, mix but um, and I certainly didn't worry about it with this record but similar style yeah we played live a lot in the hip one song that really got me going on this one is Peels is Sleep Backwards Hmm. Backward, sorry not backwards um <laughs> I love the lead on that and you mentioned before that you're not playing leads on this no i'm no joe's playing all the leads okay um, so well high five to him that's a great sound and lead it, it's oh it's yeah a really cool solo i love it um <laughs> now about about the leads you've always been a rhythm guitar player um was this by choice or just by situation? I mean, I read a, an interview once with James Hetfield and he said he doesn't play leads because he sucks at them. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think he sucks that bad, but were, was that the case with you or was it more, there's a lead player. So I just got to focus on the rhythm. Um, Yeah. It would sort of like for, as far as like a straight up solo goes, you know, I maybe did a few of them, but um World Container comes to mind as Bob Rock was like, well, just if you're going to do a solo, write it tonight and we'll record it tomorrow. Um, but then there was a lot of times where Robbie and I were kind of, it's not necessarily solo, it's kind of like trading riffs and weaving together. Robbie uh, Baker would call himself a rhythm guitar player and I would always say, no, you're not. <laughs> you're the lead guitar player. It's like, no, I'm rhythm. And I'm like, well, I'm rhythm. Yeah, we're both rhythm. Anyway, so, um, uh, you know, the, the defined solos in hit music, um, Robbie would have played them. And really just because way better at that um, particular style. Like there there are so, like I, I can appreciate what James Hetfield say, said because there are some people that are just kind of, they lean towards soloing. They, um, you can find them in a music store sometimes, <laughs> and, um, but they, you know, there's lots and lots of good ones. And um, Joe kind of leans that way. Although Joe would probably say, "No, I'm a rhythm guitar player." It's like, well, yeah, you're playing the solo, so, <laughs> so you know, I take the odd one, and um, it's rare that I write one and play the play it the same, um, but. Uh, yeah, in this case, I was just comfortable. I mean, that's why I hired Joe, uh, really, to get some nice um, leads in there and get his. Uh, he's a tasty player, too. And Greg Ball is actually a very tasty player. And, you know, did really, uh, excuse me, really um, cool little riffs in, in a lot of the songs. So, um, and I'm quite comfortable not. It doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm, I love rhythm guitar and I love playing really with the rhythm section. And, um, you know, so um, I'm very comfortable with that, too. So I'm guessing, again, I didn't 
do the research on this because I want to know from you. Yeah, uh, I, I hear a lot of Townsend and Keith Richards in your style. Would that be a fair assessment? Uh, well, I would say thanks. Um, love both the, those guys. I mean, probably especially Keith. But I'm glad to say Townsend because he, I would guess my tone is similar, more similar to Townsend than it is to Keith's um, at times anyway. You know, both inspirations, but um, I got lucky because I joined the band a bit later. Like they were a year and a half in with a sax player. This is in 1984. I joined uh, the next year and, and um, you know, they already had Robbie who was playing solos. Now it's a second guitar. So I just kind of naturally, uh, I hadn't been playing too long either. I stayed within my um, abilities for the first while. And um, I don't mean but playing it safe, but really trying to find something chunky, like New Orleans, New Orleans is sinking, you know, just that opening riff that I play. Um, I just found spots for myself. So it wasn't really like I was thinking of any other guitar player but me. I, I was just trying to fit in and play a good role. And um, so I think my style evolved really more because of those guys than anything and and more that i just wanted to have you know and we were panned left and right as a little aside don smith saved my career because you know i was on the left and robbie was on the right and a lot of times when you have two guitar players like it's pretty hard to hear malcolm young you know and and i wish he was louder and i wish they had panned uh so you could really you know you can just you used to be able to anyway just flick the 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 thing all the way to the left and just listen to the left side and uh, you can do that on headphones um with the hip i sort of have a running kind of um i thought i was always on the left but i found probably about 11 or 12 songs where i was on the right <laughs> really um, nice to me so you know yeah, i got i can tell I got all my hip albums again and and try that yeah i have kind of an advantage because i just have one ear uh, so my right ear is totally 100% deaf. So when I listen to a song or a mix or anything, you know, I can listen to it on a stereo. Okay, that's fair enough. But I want to listen on headphones. I got to listen to the left side first and then turn the headphones around and listen to the uh, right side, which you cannot do with AirPods. Um, but you can do them with the old, you know, the good Sony headphones. Is that from, uh, is it deaf because of loud music or... No, no. Okay. It was uh, like 10, 11 years ago. It's called sudden hearing loss. You just wake up deaf. I mean, there's relative um, severities of it. Um, but the more hearing you lose, the the less likely it's ever going to come back. And um, so, yeah, I just woke up that way. It, they don't know what it is. They don't want to cause it. I've heard of it more and more. Like 11 years ago, it's kind of like, like rare, rare. But um, I do know a couple of people in Kingston that uh, had the same thing happen. So there's a few hip songs that you can't hear yourself. Uh, if, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm listening, well, if I'm listening, that's why I always listen to hip songs on the left side. Wow. Uh, that's where I was. <laughs> but yeah. I do check Robbie out sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you brought up uh, New Orleans and Sink. And then one thing I've noticed, and I, I when I interviewed Gil Moore from Triumph, I know Gil. He's a great guy. Yeah, um, yeah great guy. They, um, they were the same as the hip in that every song was credited to the band. It wasn't credited to a certain person, right? Yeah. Uh, so I've always wondered this, and this is just as a fan asking, not a reporter. Um, did you come up with the riff for New Orleans is Sinking? That intro riff? Well... Yes, but um, that was a very much a band song. We had a pile of band songs, like actual true band song, Grace 2. Um, certainly New Orleans is sinking. We were just kind of jamming, and maybe the song came out of that riff, or maybe it was Robbie, because Robbie's kind of doing the chicken picking kind of thing. Right. And I, he maybe he was doing that first. Don't remember. Um I don't think anyone would, but it was definitely a band jam. And so, yeah, I was just trying to 
make something cool happen right away. It was all in the moment. And um, well, I got to say, you know, I, and I think I speak for a lot of rock fans in Canada. Thank you for that riff. I mean, that that is one of the, you know, most iconic Canadian riffs of all time. That dum dum do 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 right. I mean, yeah, it's pretty. It's it, I am because it's pretty easy to play. Um, but I just thought it was different than I just didn't want it to sound like anyone else, and um, and I obviously kept it simple. But I sort of had half a little ounce of pride about that, like Wheat Kings, you know, which um, my riff is probably the simplest song to play ever on guitar. Like, I mean, it, is, it does have three chords, barely, but, um, you know, anyone can sit down and play that. And yet it, it something happened with it. I mean, obviously it's a great lyrics and singing on Gord's part, but um, to have something be so simple is something maybe I was less comfortable with way back. But the more, it's like you say that, you know, you know it's just kind of like well it's silly really but for some reason it's attached to a song that that uh a lot of people around this country anyway and and others um gravitate towards so um i'm actually happy to be part of it <laughs> well i'll tell you a funny story uh i lived in korea for a bunch of years uh teaching english and i had a a class of you know, high school students, 15, 16 years old. And I said, what kind of music do you like? And they all like K-pop, you know, like BTS, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. So I, said, I want you guys to listen to this song. And I want to see if you can honestly tell me that your head doesn't start moving up and down as soon as it starts. And I played them New Orleans is sinking. And soon there was 10, 15 kids just going, yeah, yeah. And they just <laughs> really dug it, right? Because they never hear it. They never hear anything like that over there. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you got 15 new fans in Korea one day. <laughs> totally appreciate, totally appreciate that. That's great. I've always said that about the hip. But getting getting back to the album, let's get back to the the new album. The songwriting you mentioned earlier is all yours, right? You wrote all the songs, so yeah, I just throw them to what those kind guys. Of transition is that from writing? You know, you mentioned New Orleans is a band song. Grace Two is a band song. Now you're writing your own songs all by yourself. What kind of transition is it to to get that going without the band format? Well, I um, being desperate helps, you know, like to really just get them done and get the good ones. And so my method that seems to work for me whenever I do this, which is the last time I did it was 10 years ago. So I don't do it much, but um, is I have a bunch of guitar ideas that really, I just, um, I used to record, you know, and have a nice studio and uh, not now anymore. I just use bath when I record the bathhouse, but um, I record guitar riffs into garage band over a period of time. So, I probably had, when I started writing in past September, I probably had 60 little riffs. Uh, and sometimes they're two, three minutes long. So they're almost songs musically. And then I would just kind of sing along, record that to almost everyone. And then listen uh, a few days later and and be like okay this one's a little jam i like this one but it's funny because the band a band can't not have um a fairly big impact on a song so i was i would have this song written maybe i'm playing it on acoustic and i would text all those guys with it and they'd be like oh cool song cool song we'll to try and listen to or what are the chords or we'll try and and um you know, like Face of Time, The Face of Time, which is um, on the record. I I had that as a quiet little pensive kind of number, and then the band just started playing it. It's the same with Peels of Sweet Sleep Backwards, which you mentioned before. I mean, I thought that was going to be a fast rocker, but not that fast. I was like, you think, you think we could slow it down just a bit? And, you know, 
everyone tried to, Billy tried to, but couldn't. And and uh, like it was just no, it's got to be, it's got to be just really fast. And um, so the band certainly influenced a lot, but I had all the lyrics and and the kind of sections, the choruses and the bridges and that kind of stuff. So I had all that kind of stuff done because I wanted to just sort of flush it out and be very sure that I could live with this. And um, and they did nothing but help uh, in all of their uh particular areas um once we were rehearsing and recording them um but not much changed having said that um from the time i sent them the song it just got heavier it got heavier it got better (laughs) you know greg and joe and matt and billy all came up with great parts that i wouldn't have necessarily been able to at all and and um so there was a real flow to it but they all, you know, they remind me all the time. It's like, these are your songs. This is about you. When I tend to apologize for anything and everything, they're like, hey, you're, you're the boss, man. <laughs> <laughs> where where does your inspiration come from for lyrics? Because you probably weren't a lyricist in the hip, I'm guessing, because Gord was doing it. No, early on I was, but and uh, so was Sinclair. But uh, it gradually became obvious that, not only was Gorg a bit uncomfortable singing other people's lyrics, but he was also getting really good at it and already was. And um, there was more than enough for Gordon and I, Sinclair and I to concentrate on once it shifted over to just Gorg writing them. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I really don't know exactly what I'm on about in general on this record. It seems to be, to me, a lot about time passing. It makes sense, you know. The kids have moved out. I uh, still see them, but but they're in a different city. You know, you get kind of older. Gord died. You know, we expect it to be in the hip right now. Like, you know, are still in there, but playing and touring and writing. And we wouldn't have done all this looking back at all if Gordon hadn't um, passed away. So. Um, I think it all kind of seeps into the lyrics um, on this record, like just just what life is like, you know, the, the, the past, the time passing, that kind of thing, I think. You think? I think. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's such a rock star answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's one thing I'm a little bummed about. You're, you, you're only doing a few dates uh playing shows are you planning on doing anything after the summer like a cross-country tour ottawa hint hint um stuff like that well believe me i've noticed that too um you know it's a scattering of shows and um i think what it was um was just talking to it uh my manager who's also the hips manager jake gold just trying to sort of test out the festival kind of vibe. I mean, I love festivals. It doesn't bother me not to headline them, even though the hip did, of course, but uh, it doesn't bother me a bit to be uh, in the middle of the bill or whatever, however it worked out. And these were the offers that came through. Um, Part of me is very fine with that because I don't necessarily need to be on the road. I don't want to get in a van again, not often. Um, a bus just, you've got to be playing big sold out places to be able to sort of make it work uh, with the tour bus being so expensive. So um, these one-offs, which have kind of been averaging once every two weeks of the course of the summer, I think there's seven or eight of them. Um, so far, so good. Of course, uh, well, I don't. I shouldn't say of course, but um, it is true that we want to keep playing, and we want to um, we want to play out west. Yeah, we want to play Ottawa, of course. We want to, you know, there's we're missing a lot here. It's really just Ontario festivals, and it's kind of just dipping the toe into the water. Just okay, let's see how it goes. It's been going great, you know. The the band's heavy, you know. We we practice once a week for a reason uh we did last night because we're playing in a place called kingsville this coming saturday which is just outside windsor a big festival we got a good headlining spot 
And um, yeah, so we like to stay really tight and it's just been a pleasure, all of it. Um, so um, we're going to just keep going. No question that we'll put our hand up to do more festivals, um, you know, next year, like Blues Fest, Mark Monahan, um, yeah. you know, or, or uh, the Ottawa Folk Fest. I, I played that uh, with by my other solo band 10 years ago. So anyway, yeah, the desire is there to play. And uh, we're just going to see, is it going to be in the fall? Is it going to be in the winter? Uh, we'll see. And um, certainly if it's not, then next spring, summer, you know, the record won't even be a year old yet. So uh, the intention is there. Good. This is a gear question for guitar players out there. Um, my brother saw you in Gananoque, what, a couple weeks ago? You played in Gananoque? Yeah. And for people who are not from Ontario, yes, that's the real name of a place. <laughs> it's a crazy name, but, it, but it's true. And Beautiful little town, yeah. Oh, it's an awesome place, yeah. But what Rick told me, my brother, was that he noticed that, I mean, he was a huge hip fan, um, still is. He noticed that you're playing Telecasters now, and I think when you were in the hip, you were mostly using Les Pauls, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was a telly for the first um, three records, so I don't, we, we never count the baby record we call it but up, up to here road apples and fully completely i was telly and then day for night i switched to les paul's and and stayed with that for the rest of our uh playing days and um the only time i'd really pull the telly out would be like for a song good life if you don't weaken um pull it out once in a while and then when we did the fully completely tour, I did all that on the telly because I had recorded on the telly. So, you know, I kind of always thought of the telly as my main guitar if I had to choose one. But then uh, Last Paul Sunburst, first it was a Black Beauty, a black one. And then um, then I used the Sunburst really from Trouble at the Hen House on. And I just got used to the tone. It felt like it was sort of maybe even more different from Robbie. So it kind of uh, it expanded our, our guitar horizon sound um, in my mind anyway. And um, so, yeah, uh, it's nice to be back playing a telly. And that was just a natural call. Just like, I don't know. I'm just going to use a telly. Why not? It's also a lot lighter. Yeah. And it's it's um, like it's kind of it can get heavy enough too and that might have been a factor too joe joe's tone's pretty heavy greg's can be um and so tellies are good at, at squeezing uh in there you know i i wouldn't say i necessarily play a clean tone but um it if i plug the les paul in for the same settings on the amp that the les paul is going to sound heavier dirtier but I felt like it would get in the way a bit more. Um, I don't know why, but are you a straight into the amp guy? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have a tube screamer and a, a a slight delay pedal, which I really use more as an echo. Um, but that's it. Um, and I don't turn it on very often. So yeah, I'm straight into the, the amp kind of guy. Best sound you can get, right? Well, I mean, there would be a, a there would be a debate there. Uh, you know, Robbie's pedal board looks like it could go into space and <laughs> fly, um, and so he may disagree. But when you're, you know, he's the coloring too. You know, you, you have so many more options. But yeah, straight into the amp is kind of the best thing you can do, especially when you're starting out and playing clubs and that kind of stuff, just, just get a good, um, a good tone with, with uh, just your guitar and your amp. You, you mentioned Malcolm before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it into, hey, a, into a Marshall, right? Really works. And, uh, really yeah, Keith's the same. And, um, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's good to be able to do that and not rely so much on um, effects and that kind of stuff. Okay. I'll give you one more question. And this is a, um, I know you weren't 
in the hip right from the start, but you joined, like you said, about a year and a half into it. But there was a rumor, and I want to find out if this is true or not. I read a rumor once that you guys had about 400 songs at your disposal. And you could play any of them any night. Like cover songs. Cover songs, yeah. Yeah. Well, we were a cover band. I don't know about 400. I would guess 200. Um, yeah. And um, like we were just playing a lot. And so that was in my time as well. Um, we were playing original songs. But, you know, some places didn't want you to play original songs. So we'd call one of our songs as, you know, by the pretty things or whatever. But we knew a lot of covers. Um, and uh, they were all like, you know, British kind of R&B kind of stuff. The pretty things for sure. And um, early, early stones. And, um, you know, uh, we just could draw from a lot of them. And most of them were pretty simple and and um, kind of easy to remember, which is always a good thing in a song. So, uh, yeah, it took us a while to not be a cover band, but that's certainly where we cut our teeth, doing covers. So what was the craziest cover you ever did back in the day? Um, you know, we did uh, Certain Girl. Well, that was just a great, like, there were great ones. The train kept rolling. We, we uh, for a period of time, would um, end the show with that. Um you know, there was just, a, we did a lot of Dylan covers, uh, okay. early Dylan covers. So we really did a lot of songs that people didn't know at all. And, but they were all kind of just, they just had that sort of beat. Mary, Mary, we did some monkeys, you know, and and um, and uh, that was always good. I'm a believer and that, that kind of thing. So, um, so people would come and for the first year and a half, I was one of the people coming that was just, uh, you know, best friends of Ford. So he put me on the list if I wasn't working. And uh, they were just really appealing. Even if he didn't know the song, it was just like, this is very different. Like it wasn't, at the time, it was kind of like, not a metal scene, but kind of a glam rock scene developing uh, of which we were totally the opposite. And right. uh, so we were able to build a crowd in, in Kingston and then we just started stretching out, you know up towards Ottawa and then and the 401 and so that's how we did it it's the only thing we knew how to do and then gradually we realized hey we got to write songs and we, we got to make them good and we just got to keep getting better and better so, so were, were the songs that you were doing were they <laughs> I'm making a word up here were they tragically hippified um or did you sound yeah, like the originals like, is that where you got your sound, where you started to realize, hey, we've got a sound and take it from there? Yeah, I mean, there were some early originals that um, fit in with the covers we were playing. And it it seemed like the early originals of ours that didn't uh, make the first blue record, um, but still were good songs. Baby Blue Blood um reformed baptist blues which uh was on saskadelphia surprisingly no one realized we recorded it uh huh. during road apples but uh they were like pretty heavy like probably heavier than the the covers we were playing you know except maybe train kept it rolling but um so i think it doing all those covers and having you know a good chunk of of uh you know, three years of constant playing, doing those covers, I think really affected our sound and affected the way we wrote even. And, um, you know, a lot of it was 12 bar blues, except played quickly and, you know, disguised with uh, sort of a different left turn in the chorus or something. But um, Neurons of Sinking is 12 bar blues, you know, so it was kind of like we were very inspired by R&B and, and uh, certainly by uh, the early stones and the yardbirds big time and and so that was our inspiration and then also like you mentioned earlier we didn't listen to anything while we were recording like it wasn't like hey let's you know I, i'm not saying i don't have a problem with it but it's just like oh let's make it sound like 
this Led Zeppelin song and then you put the song on, you're in the control room. It's like, yeah, we, we never did that once. The only time we did it was Bob Rock was like, why don't you guys do that? And we're like, well, because and then then we sound just totally naturally like ourselves, you know. I mean, someone might be listening on headphones at night to something else, but we didn't ever do it as a band or even discuss sounding like anyone. And there's a song, Kids Don't Get It, on um, on uh, World Container. And uh, Bob did a great job with that record. And, um, and he was like, well, why don't, you know, it's kind of clashy and it's kind of like reggae. Why don't, how come you're not doing that? And we're like, and me, me specifically, I was like, well, because I want to do my own thing. I don't want to sort of imitate. And he's like, well, why don't you do it? And I said, okay. And he was he was right, because it doesn't sound like a reggae song at all. It's a crazy song. Um, but, um, yeah, we just stayed away from our influences at the time of writing and recording. Um, and I think that helped. And and everyone, we didn't get on each other about anything. You know, like Robbie sounded every sound. The odd time he'd say, what are you playing there? And uh, we may discuss something, notes or whatever, and um, and parts, but not often. And so everyone was really doing their own thing. And it was just coming out of um, the four of us musically. And then Gord just kind of reacting. You know, you can never predict which one he would react best to. And so those floated to the top, the ones that um, he had something really going for then we okay we'll play that one again tomorrow and uh that's kind of how we did it how it evolved interesting you know it's funny since you mentioned that you replaced the saxophone player in the band i've had a running version of new orleans is sinking going through my head with the saxophone instead of the little guitar riff (laughs) (laughs) yeah you should re-record that as that (laughs) (laughs) i can't imagine the hip with the sax player there must be some some audio of this somewhere oh yeah yeah um there's a a show at the copper penny who knows these days you know the internet police take things off um but uh, there's a restaurant called the copper penny that i was in the crowd and the the sax player was davis manning um unfortunately may he rest in peace because he died uh like over the last i have no sense of time anymore but maybe a year ago and he was a cool dude and i knew him well but he was 40 and they were 20 oh and he wanted they were all in university and he wanted to hit the road they were all at queens and uh well johnny was still in high school grade 13 and um davis just got frustrated understandable because they were really developing a crowd in kingston but they had no interest in hitting the road they wanted to you know stay in school and be a university man kind of thing and um so davis couldn't take anymore and um which is fair enough and he was a beautiful songwriter in his own right and he ended up moving at west uh which is where he had first lived and um then they went i don't know three four months so maybe like 10 gigs uh because the school was still in and just with the four of them and then one day, Gore Downey called and said, hey, we want you to join the band. So I was like, okay, love to. Love you guys already. And the rest of I thought they, I thought they were going to be big, honestly. I, I was like, because my dad was like, so you're going to do this like full time? And I said, yeah, well, once school's out in the summer. And he's like, backup plan. And I'm like, don't think I need one. I think I think we're really going to go. And then we worked hard, of course, for uh, three years after. And then by then we were recording our first record deal, all that kind of stuff. And and uh, so we never looked back. Lucky, just a lucky combination of people, I think. Yeah, and lucky that also, you know, your first, well, up to here, hit pretty hard in Canada. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was... <laughs> Not instant recognition because you'd been working for a long time before that, but definitely with the first album, it it did well. Yeah, it did. And then by the time, you know, we toured that and we were club band still, but the clubs were getting bigger. And, um, you know, Barry Moore's um, Town Pump in Vancouver. Um, yeah, got out of the horseshoe, but 
uh, I think at that time we moved up to the Diamond Club, which is now the Phoenix. So uh, by the time Road Apples was finished, we came home with it and we knew it was coming out. It was like, and we had Road Apples in our pocket, you know, um, kind of Little Bones in particular, but um, yeah, it was like, okay, well, I think we're kind of set up here, you know, from up to here kind of set up. And even that blue, Baby Blue record, I mean, that set us up too with a couple of small town bring down and Right. You know, um, so we were, we felt like we arrived. So when Road Apples came out, that, that was our biggest feeling of intense arrival, like for the first few days of that being out. Right. What year was that? 1988, maybe? Road Apples? No, Road Apples was uh, 90, if I had to guess. 90? Yeah. Because okay. I think completely was 92. I yeah. could be wrong, and uh, they'd be lining up to correct me right now. But <laughs> I'm going to go with Road Apples was 90, and Fully Completely was 92. When did you start the another roadside attraction? 93. So that would have been after Fully Completely? Yes. Okay, yeah. so that, I think, is the first time I saw you guys was on the another roadside attraction tour. At yep. the Speedway in Ottawa, or...? You would have played at what Lansdowne Park? I think. Uh, I think the first time we played at the Speedway, but I could be wrong because oh, we did that is right. the Speedway. Yes, 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 yes. I, I remember. remember. Yeah, but I I could be wrong actually because I think Blues Traveler was on that, so it it might have been Lansdowne Park. That that the first one was with Midnight Oil. That's the one I saw. That with Midnight Oil. You could That's be right. I, that may be Lansdowne Park because I think the Speedway was blues traveler amongst others so we did 90, yeah. yeah so we did it 93 95 97 right every other summer and uh it was great it's it, it was one of our biggest achievements i think just yeah. to pull that how, off how cool was midnight oil back in the day eh? yeah they were tough to follow um really good we were all big fans they were they were very nice uh, but they were there to blow us off the stage. They hadn't really heard of us. So our first gig was Seabird Island, Vancouver. And, um, and it was like, well, <laughs> the show's coming. They're going on and we got to go on after them. So here we go. What and, was that? Uh, Maybe uh, Blue Sky Mine, that tour? Uh, Even Dust, I, think, I think Blue Sky Mine was just after that for them. That might have been their next record. It was... Uh, Diesel and dust. It was diesel and dust. Yeah, even even worse to go up against. <laughs> Beds are burning, right? <laughs> yeah. So they come out and open with that, and it's like, oh, okay, I guess we'll. Uh, but no, we watched it and loved it, and we knew that we had a crowd, and so, um, but we certainly had to, we had to kick it into gear, and um, and felt like we did, and so it, it all worked out. But we were setting ourselves up. If we hadn't been able to kick it in here. <laughs> Even Blues Traveler is tough to follow. They're a great band, too. They are. We toured with them a lot, actually. Um, we opened them for them in America uh, on a couple of tours. And they opened for us in Europe and in Canada. Uh, except in Europe, uh, when we played Paris, we opened up for them. Because um, we'd never played Paris before. And they had a, a thing and we had nothing. But in Holland and Belgium and... Um, you know all the northern europe um we were we were known but they're a great bunch of guys and really good band and again tough to follow well uh, hopefully we will see you in ottawa at some point soon uh whether it's yeah. fall summer winter whatever um so it's and best of luck with the the album and best of luck with whatever shows you're doing i know you got a couple coming up this in the next couple of weeks yeah well and thanks a lot ken appreciate it Thank you so much. This has been this has been great. I learned a lot, and uh, um, again, love the album. Well, thanks very much. That means a lot. Appreciate thanks. it. Have a good day. You too.